Uh, hey everyone, good afternoon, good morning. I'm Tejas. Uh, I work currently as a senior PPM and have been into data science since 2012-13 onwards. Uh, my usual work is around uh, natural language processing, uh, forecasting, and I have been working in consultant role as well as uh, an individual capacity, both of them in my current role. What we have today is a session called federated learning. It's right now more into research than the applied part. And with the help of all of us who have joined the session, maybe if we uh, start using this, it would become more mainstream right now. So uh, I'll just walk through the session. Um, so basically right now we have seen quite a few growth into machine learning technologies, which are empowering quite a few artificial intelligence softwares and applications into areas of computer visions, speech recognitions, natural language processing, and, and you know, recommendations engine everywhere. So basically either it use Google Analytics or Google uh, bots, Amazon Echo, Amazon website, Flipkart everywhere, uh, artificial intelligence is present now, even if you, um, you know, cars like Tesla who have automation uh, or accidental detection system, even in the new Apple Watch, there is an accidental system which kind of triggers an SOS in case they think there was an accident. So all the system basically use uh, in AI or a machine learning algorithm at the end of it, right? And all this work best based on the data or quality of data that they receive. And why this has been, you know, uh, being driven in the last 10 to 12 years is due to the emergence of a large amount of processing CPUs that are available to local public, as well as uh, big data technology systems that have come up, which can allow you to process and gather a large amount of data, transform and you know, use it into an aggregation or a real time form of it. Now, modern society, uh, after the emergence, right? They kind of became aware about this data being used. And then when something new comes up, there are abusers who also come into the picture. Uh, so they started looking at data and if the systems were not good enough protected, the data started becoming public. Uh, government took notice of all this and now has started to put in places where they can control the data of how it is being used, what they are being used for, who owns the data. Those kind of questions have come up. So there are government introduced forms like GDPR and all that, which can now, if not being, uh, you know, can hamper AI if we don't kind of react to this new uh, era of how the data is being used. Uh, what do we mean by all this that, you know, how this data is being used? So if you see right now, Amazon or Flipkart website, uh, have you browsed the data? Have they billing information on which products do you buy? What keywords do you use? Uh, what is your purchase history? Uh, what has you favorited or whatever you have put it into your wish list? All this data basically gets used into a recommendation system, then which gets aggregated and used uh, as in form of a metadata for other users to recommend product to them or showcase the order of the products or which product basically they want to purchase or which vendor they want to work more closely with. So all this kind of magic happens through the data. And if data is not there, it will not happen. Now, all this uh, seems still okay in the sense that metadata being used in form where you are just purchasing, which is kind of similar when you go to a shop, other people can look at it and get informed decisions based on that. But what happens if similarly medical data is being used? or medical data gets out of hand or somebody gets hold of your private information. So that is where the regulations like GDPR have been, you know, making sure that PII, PCI data does not get out. Hospitals are able to lock in their data into their local system. They are not able to share or even the financial data like your credit scores, your purchase history, your ATM transactions do not go out of their particular VPNs or local networks. Now, because of this, this uh, how do you, you know, without data, you can't go into much or improve your artificial intelligence software or ML. So there was a thought process that what can we do to make sure that data still can stay local and we can get benefit out of it. At that time, uh, there was a new technology which was coming up like blockchain. Uh, and so people thought of let's merge both blockchain and uh, 
AI and create something new. That is mostly what we have called as federated learning right now. We'll go to the next slide. So, so initially when this um, distributed computing system or thought of having data only on the edge devices came into picture, uh, this was the first uh, pass that people took at it. Uh, they made sure that all the edge devices like GPUs or CPUs uh, stay within a boundary of a region. It be it a state boundary or a nation boundary or a region boundary. And then models get trained on that particular data. Uh, they create gradients and those gradients are basically sent to a central server. They're based on the gradients received from different edge devices. They get aggregated into system and new aggregated gradients come up and they basically get again shared to the edge devices. And this, uh, we solve a bit of problem of our data because now it's being stored in the lo local devices or edge devices, they are not getting stored. However, we are still sharing gradients out of it, right? So somebody can be malicious and wrap the gradients and understand what kind of data that we are sharing. So it was a good system to start off with, but it still had it flows. So how do we improve this? Uh, so a new paradigm was thought that instead let's have the models only being discussed or distributed between the network rather than any of the data. So now in the edge devices, models are being stored, trained and kept and whatever weights that we have from the different models that only get aggregated into the central server. So now even if somebody is able to uh, capture your weightage, it, it does not make any sense because without the model itself, weights make no sense. And now your data also stays local. So there is very less chance of any private data or private information getting shared. What it also allows you to do is that uh, the computation power of your edge devices can be utilized to train your model. So we have seen in recent time, we have better working mobile devices, our watches, tablets, all have you know high capacity CPU chips. So basically they can train model and keep uh, updating in and only uh, your basic server takes up the aggregation part of it and create a model out of it. So it saves on that network capacity as issue as well, which was there in the distributed system. So just to take a summary of what we discussed is uh, when we discuss about federated learning, there were two approaches that the systems work with. One was the distributed, one was the federate. Um, the limitation of the network issue or the data loss was kind of an overcome by uh, making sure that only weights get distributed, but it again failed the system with uh, data heterogeneity issue or system heterogeneity issue. What do we mean by system and data heterogeneity is, let's say a client or an end user only performs same kind of work or a very less data. Uh, let's say, take an example of a supermarket, uh, your edge devices uh, have what they have in Australia might not be similar what they have in US or in Indian supermarket. So that kind of creates an issue because you can't directly share data between them or the models between them and they can create some bias in the modeling stuff itself. So this were kind of all theoretical approaches that we had till now. Uh, let me take a pause here and see if, if there are any questions. So gradient, what do we mean is basically, uh, so instead of model, we are now sharing all the parameters like uh, what columns that you are using, what kind of uh, weightage that we have with those and what is their importance of in the model itself. So those kind of information again becomes an issue, right? Because now we know that let's say, let's take an example of uh, user behavior data. So we say that age, place, uh, those kind of variables become more important in your uh, data that gets shared over the time. So somebody can you know understand that when, when you are trying to shop something, what are your preferred, preferred uh, factors that you look at? So basically that kind of creates an issue. Okay, I see another question from Anirban. GDRP is a European, uh, I think there is a type of GDPR should be there. Uh, so basically it's a European uh, regulation that allows uh, data sharing between different systems, how to stop it. Yeah, we have GDPR only on the first slide, Anirban. 
uh, it's a role uh, like how we have in india that uh, we cannot share data of aadhar card and it gets xxx when we kind of sh share it with numbers so similarly europe has very strict norms on what gets stored in your cookies and what information that can be scrapped from website what information can be shared between uh, countries like that so gdpr is that uh, law that allows you to understand what kind of data privacy security that we have uh, next question we have is from ram uh, similar to multi tenant audit yes that's definitely the same uh, it's similar to how our application logic that we write now it is right that we have different servers that we place in one in europe one in us one in australia and like that and that particular regions user only log into that particular system and kind of share data with them so it, it it's on the similar architecture where we have gpu machines located in different parts and in distributed on their data goes to those gpu systems only let me look at the chat as well now we'll, uh, we have a question from navin how it relates to tiny ml to corporate ml dia so there is no uh, stoppage of whether it can be only deep learning algorithms or a simple machine learning algorithms uh, based on the computation power that we have and the amount of time the system is available we can use it so once we go in the forward right there are different aggregation strategies that we use in federated learning that will kind of explain more of how we can kind of use it or what type of algorithms we can use it all right i think we have cleared all the questions and queries till now we'll move to the next one one second all right so now uh, we talked about uh, the different kind of algorithms or uh, what aggregation method basically gets being used uh, by this federal algorithm right because that becomes your single point of failure if your aggregation method or evaluation kind of has any bias into it the complete model system fails because now everybody will be used with that bias um, so what we have right now is basically four strategies that are available or kind of quite uh, famous or available strategies first is uh, federated average what they try to do is that they understand that all of the clients are on the same level and whatever data or weights uh, they are sharing basically back to us is of similar importance and we kind of look at that and uh, what our aim is to basically reduce the loss that are happening at a local level and then thus we have an overall less loss at the global level so it's the most simplest method that kind of being used right now and it can work in a less complicated system where you are just starting off with the federated learning what was happening in this one is that uh, what happens if your most of the devices are very slow or they do not have in, enough uh, juice so what will federated average will do is they will try to try drop system because there is a cycle that they have to follow and because they look at all of their devices to provide input if within certain range if you are not able to do it they'll kind of start dropping you out uh, but let's say in worst case scenario the 80 to 90% of devices are very slow then basically you have no input data right your machine now has become very biased or it is having issues with the data that they are only looking at 10% of your possible um, complete uh, population and rather than then you know trying to create a model which will work for a larger system so that's why a federated proximate system was used what it was allowing you is that if there are any larger changes in the data set that is happening right because if they are saying the model changes very large then they will try to penalize them so basically why it would what it was reduce is that now if there is heterogeneous in the data then it will becomes faster to uh, converge uh, again but this also has an issue because now let's say if you have similar type of data everywhere then this model will not work because now everybody is on the same plan similar data there will be not many large changes so there is no penalizing of anybody it will still keep going in the same manner so that's why a uh, q federal average model was introduced which kind of tried to combine best of both the strategies that we had federated average and federated proximity what it used to do was that instead of uh, you know giving any penalization or anything what it tried to do was whoever was giving you more data it tried to give uh, preference to that and kind of 
assuming that it resumes more of a population, we'll try to become more nearer to that. So that was one of the strategies that was being done. Uh, it also kind of allows to be more fairer across the board. So models now become uh, with similar to a population or a larger, you know, they, they are trying to be in the same range rather than, you know, having any uh, differentiation being input into the system. So on a overall, your models will become, start performing better uh, on an average device. But let's say there was some outlier cases, it will not take into action into those. So that's why uh, a new strategy was combined because let's say you, you are uh, having a car system which is uh, very new to a country and your partial data models were in US. So your Indian inputs or anything would be just overwritten by all this uh, strategies that we discuss. So let's say, how do you prioritize this kind of data as well, or your own data as well? So let's say somebody bought an iPhone from US and they have come to India. There are not many users in India. So whenever he types into his local language, Hindi in Canada or uh, anything, and the recommendation system will still give him inputs from US, right? Because that's the language the model was trained on. It becomes very cumbersome for the user. So a new strategy was developed, which was called personal federated average. What it tried to do is it tried to give importance to the local model itself rather than or local data itself, rather than getting more from a aggregated data model system that they are getting. It will keep just uh, giving preference to the local inputs or local data that the system is producing. Uh, what it will do is after two or three iterations of uh, the global weights that they come in, it will start ignoring that and it will give, start giving prioritization to the local. So your model still will be more or less on par with the global parameters, but always hyper-tuned with your internal data that you are trying together. So it will always give you best result for your own rather than you know uh, a larger population or a larger area that tries to cover. So let's say there are 10 people using the same model into uh, 10 different uh, places in city, they will have their own 10 different recommendation system going on in parallel. This is to something MAML approach in meta learning, if you have seen uh, model agnostic meta learning. Uh, let me look at any questions or queries that we have. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Farzana. Will there more be latency? Uh, so latency will be more when uh, we had basically data moving between system. In distributed system, there is a higher latency. When there are weights only moving, so basically models only moving in between, the latency becomes lower because then you can zip it and kind of share it across. Plus, uh, you don't need to uh, you know, refresh it multiple times. You can have a fixed time that you can use it. Even when we are using system, right? We can define system that how the sampling happens, when everybody's data will be shared, it would it that everybody will be contributing or not like that. So those kind of things we have to take care when we are doing the client server relationship between Apple and it kind of drives how the latency will work. Our next question is from Naveen. Uh, please explain how federal learning can contribute in terms of reducing the infrastructure cost. So now what we are trying to do is basically rather than running anything on the single server, what happens right now, we try to run the model on the edge devices. So let's say you have uh, any juice or maximum juice that we have on the end edge systems, right, that we are trying to in use. And as you have local data is also very less, it becomes faster and is able to, you know, try to reach the optimal point faster. Uh, right now, if you see, right, any deep learning algorithm that you want to run, uh, for an example, a uh, um, image classifier, right? So you get image from all the cameras from the city uh, for one day and then try to run it. It will take at least four, five, six hours to run it because what is now happening is there is a central system where the complete day's data has been gathered in. It has to go through all those uh, lakhs and crores of pictures that are there and then kind of gets out. Let's say if the same model was running on each camera, then it would kind of distribute the work, right? Like they, they might have captured thousands of images, but it's kind of one-tenth of the scale of what will happen at the centralized server. So kind of it becomes faster, okay? And thus reduces the infrastructure cost. So you don't need now uh, 
Titan class or P3 class of GPU machines to run your models. Uh, a simil, simpler version can you know do it. Even CPUs in case let's say uh, your amount of data gathered is lost. So that's how you save money on infrastructure. <coughs> okay. So now there is uh, Ravi Kumar is asking Nano is put to run ML models in H devices. You can convert the model to fit on and tensor flow model. Yeah. Uh, so there are quite a few devices which are support. So one of the so I have in this slide we are going through the different frameworks that are right now supporting this, and I'll take an example of Flower, uh, which is an uh, agnostic uh, common framework that we can use and supports quite a few devices and very famous with IoT devices as of now. We'll go through that. All right. Uh, please, how can we use federated learning in NLP, especially in sentient analysis domain? So let's say uh, so we have all used Google Keyboard, right? A uh, Google Keyboard is an excellent example of federated learning system, which was like a Google were a pioneer of using it, and they are using right now. So. Uh, sentiment analysis can be part of that service, which gets called whenever somebody is writing any message, regardless of which service they are using. And uh, that service running in background can give you uh, sentiments in the real time. So now the sentiments are for tuned for that particular local language or the region, and now can be in more tune with um, what that particular word or a dialect means. So this is how it, the federated learning can help you in uh, this edge device usage. All right. Uh, so right now, what research or frameworks are being available? Uh, so majority of research right now is happening in encryption, uh, transfer learning, uh, adversarial network usage, differential services, how we can you know, incorporate more into this model. Uh, I have kept the link here called uh, Awesome Federated Learning. It basically has all the papers ranked and based on where they are, which category they belong to. So it's a good resource to go through that. Uh, for any understanding that you want to increase for the federated learning part. There are three major frameworks which support federated learning. First is TensorFlow by Google. Then we have PyTorch and PySeft. And then there is something called as Flower. Um, right now, TensorFlow is having some issue that you have to use either the GCE image or you have to do it on your own uh, infrastructure. The Google Colab is not in tune with TensorFlow because Google Colab is running on Python 3.7, whereas TensorFlow requires Python 3.9 uh, support for your latest library to run. So it's kind of an issue as of now. What I'll try to give you an example is uh, using Flower with PyTorch uh, to showcase a simple example of image classification. There are also, let's say, if you want to do your private research, there is this site. Uh, leaf.cmu, uh, which kind of gives you data, which you can use for your personal uh, research or getting more understanding of the data. So you can use this data set. It's free of charge available. Now, uh, just a few assumptions that I have made uh, to create the demo. I have made sure that all devices are taking part. There is no uh, sampling that I'm doing right now. Synchronization is happening uniformly uh, because this all can be in real time when you create an application you have to take care of. Uh, and what I'm again assuming is that uh, whenever a training or modeling happens, it happens during the you know, downtime or when there is no CPU requirement. So basically systems are all available when I'm running the model. So these are my three assumptions that I have taken. Uh, Again, as I mentioned, this can be done using uh, deep learning or machine learning, any of the algorithms. Right now, I'll create an example with deep learning to uh, show the image classification. This is the algorithm that we'll be using. It's uh, Flower. Uh, it's contributed by CMU. And uh, right now, if we see, uh, it's being used by Samsung, Nokia. So they are more into IoT devices. Uh, where this being used and it supports basically a very large cater of, uh, you know, uh, AWS, GCP. Um, so <coughs> Android, iOS, Raspberry, you basically you say what you want and all of those are devices uh, can, you know, use this flower to run their modeling. Okay. Uh, any queries or questions? Let's see. And then we'll start with the demo. All right. 
Okay, uh, I'll share this Jupyter notebook with you guys. It's a simple notebook. Uh, first step, what basically I'm trying to do is install Flower, uh, Torch, Torch Vision, Matplotlib, just for the you know image if you want to showcase the grid and all that. These are some of the packages and libraries that I'm trying to import. Majority of is that we'll be using in this demo is CFAR 10. So I have just imported the data set. Um, here, uh, the, the note is uh, I am right now using CPU because I'm using the free version of the Google Colab. In case you are on the paid version or if you're able to get uh, sufficient GPUs, just change it to CUDA zero. It will kind of allow you to use GPUs. Uh, but right now I'm using CPU, so that's what. Uh, this basically showcases what libraries and packages that we have and what versions they are using. Uh, as you know, right, in CFAR 10, basically there are 10 uh, different classes of images, plane, car, bird, cat, et cetera, and we'll try to kind of classify it using penetrated learning. Uh, I have taken 10 clients uh, for this example. So basically what we'll do is that assuming that there are 10 devices who will be contributing to the system and trying to run models. And this is busy a simple data set proportion. So whatever data that we have in CFAR 10, I'll kind of convert it into 10 different partitions. These partitions are not being done either using any uh, methods for sampling or anything. I'm just doing a natural partition, uh, natural partition based on size. Uh, but let's say if you want to be more real image or you know more with real time scenarios, you can use those differentiation algorithms to kind of create more mixer or a, not homogeneous data and kind of try to play around with it, how the penetrated learning model works in that case. What this natural flow allows us to do is we have in each of the 10 partitions, some good grouping of different kind of categories. All right, um, as we said, we will have 10 train test and validate set because now we have 10 clients. Uh, this is a sample of, as I mentioned, right? We have good grouping of all the, uh, categories into one group. Again, the samples can be uh, done it in like on one client can only give cat trucks, one client only gives you cats. This is like, you know, the, the data, we can kind of do differentiation and see how a federal learning works with that. But again, um, for this tutorial, I'm just uh, doing a simpler version of it. All right, so first what we'll do is we'll do the classical example of how it happens right now. So I have done a CNN uh, algorithm that I have created. So basically what it does is uh, we have two layers, one convolution layer, then pooling layer, then another convolution layer, and then linear layers, which will make sure that our images kind of get classified. I'm using ReLU uh, for all purposes. I have used Adam for our uh, Basically, uh, I think you guys are aware, right? It's like the most advanced version that we have right now for optimization, and it's kind of works faster than any other method. So uh, that that's what I'm kind of using as of now. Uh, this will kind of give us uh, at each image what was the loss, uh, and then kind of come to a solution on categorization. So when I ran it for 10 epochs, basically, my accuracy figure was somewhere around 47%. Again, if we increase the number of epochs, we'll get better. But uh, for this uh, tutorial, 10 should be good enough. Now we'll start with the main federated learning. So for any federated learning, right, as we had discussed, we have to set parameters. So for any client we have to create, we'll have get, set, fit, and evaluate as these three methods that we'll do. Uh, so that is what we have defined with the client with get parameters, fit, and evaluate. So basically, whenever we kind of we create parameters that get set into the models, and if let's say they want to get or fetch parameters from the central server, we have a method for that as well. Now, this is just setting up, uh, we want to have 10 different uh, clients. So I'm just giving them all a different ID based on string and creating different devices just to simulate the server. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Flower does not give out of the box uh, aggregated parameters like how we had in CNN, right? That you know get uh, 
from 10 different training example they kind of get you an aggregated version of your accuracy so what i've done is i've written a simple function which will work uh, or at like which will act like custom matrix uh, and give me error numbers and how my accuracy is so i have defined that in weighted average function now this this is my strategy. I am using federated average for my uh, optimization. What I have mentioned is that minimum of five and maximum of 10 clients we have. This uh, will have uh, all of our 10 clients work in it, but this basically works that if let's say some uh, clients are not available or they are out of bound or out of range or they are busy with something activity. So what we are saying is at least five should be there to start the training. And I have mentioned that uh, the function just to aggregate it as a custom metric. I'm saying let's run 10 rounds because we had 10 epochs. So I just want to showcase uh, you know, Apple to Apple comparison. So I'm just having 10 rounds of uh, federated learning as well. Um, this takes about, uh, you know, quite a few times. So it took me about uh, 460 seconds. So that's why I had run it just before our session. And the accuracy figures that I got was after 10 round was about 49. So at least about 2% better than what we had, uh, but that's okay. Uh, similar range, but now what had happened was everything happened on the system and uh, we didn't have a centralized system that was doing so data stayed and kind of, if you see here, it started with 0 0.6 and trying to keep getting better after each round. And just to see the output of it, I have one output printed. So first is cat, ship, 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 uh, plane, frog. So kind of good enough with this small set that we had and small amount of you know rounds of testing that we did. Um, I'll stop here for any questions that we have. So now let's say anybody wants to start working on this, right? What should be the pitfalls or what should they be aware about? Uh, one of the problem that we have is high, how many numbers of S devices that are participating. Uh, let's say if, if it's like a Google Android device, they'll be in the range of hundreds of millions, right? But let's say if you are a very new startup that you are starting to it, so it will be like one, two, three devices. Then in that case, do you even want to go for this kind of federated learning, right? Because then it's a simpler problem that you can do it at a centralized location. So that is something that to look at when trying to make a decision whether a federated learning or a central approach that you want to do. Next is a distribution of data. Uh, basically, how much data a particular edge device is kind of trying to, you know, give it to you, because that kind of can create a bias when you are doing an average or aggregation of uh, model. Uh, again, um, so the idea is to have everybody, you know, give into the system at the same time. Uh, what some of the companies have started doing is that they try to monetize the amount of data a user contributes. So that is something that an approach can be looked at. Uh, when trying to overcome this pitfall. Uh, next one is network bandwidth and latency. So let's say your devices stay in a very remote area, like a hilly area or uh, in jungles, uh, you'll get data after every three, four days when they come into good practice or a satellite comes into that area. So in that case is how do you take make sure that the models get updated properly and, you know, what should be the optimal purpose of sending that? Uh, do you use queues? Do you use uh, Kafka? So all that also comes into picture when you're doing those kind of devices. So those use cases have to be very specific when you are trying to do it and might require a more customized approach than a simpler algorithm that you can kind of use from either TensorFlow or PyTorch. Uh, where it's kind of actively being worked upon is healthcare because of uh, the US healthcare right now, if you see, right, uh, quite a few hospitals have sh data issues that they can't share data across the network or they are having an uh, state-wise data regulations or federal regulations. So this is something where federated learning can work great. We can have it on their laptops and tablets installed and everything remains within there. However, the whole uh, healthcare modeling kind of gets upgraded. So that is something that is being looked at. Uh, another is education, um, because uh, if you see, right, uh, mostly uh, we have a central board system that happens, but state-wise the results vary a lot. So is there something that we can look at from the behavioral point of view of students, if we can have models, something like that. So that is something that can be looked at. Um, 
financial sectors, smart city, put it in examples, more and more IoT devices that we kind of get. Um, federated learning can help us with the data privacy, data ownership, as well as data monetization in those areas. Like if people can, you know, be paid to create data for you. So that is something that can be looked at. Um, so I think we are on track. We have 15 minutes left for any queries, questions that we can have. Yeah, there are some questions in the chat. Uh, can you please answer that? Sure. All right, I'll start from the bottom. Uh, Ashish, can you recommend some books and tutorials? So right now, uh, there are quite a... Um, so this is more of a research topic right now. So there are very less amount of books available. Uh, I'll try to share. Uh, not I don't have it right now, but I'll add a PPT with the number of books that I have gone through or I have read in the past and I think, you know, can help you guys. Uh, but there is no recent book that has come in. Last book I think was, which had come in was in 2021 on federated learning. Uh, can you recommend some paid papers on that? Yeah, so papers, I already listed a link. Uh, this is uh, the awesome page. Uh, it has all the latest papers, again, categorized by year and all that we can look at. Uh, this is a good source to start off with for learning, federated learning. Yeah, I think we covered all the questions. Anything else, uh, folks, please write down. Or, uh, okay, uh, what is the key link? Yeah, notebook link I'll share in the PPT. It will, I think, shared by analytics with your team after the call. I'll add the link there as well. It will be downloadable. Uh, what are the key limitations of federated learning, which is blocking its wide industry adoption? Uh, the major area is the complexity of the devices, right? Um, it, it one solution will not work plus uh, there is always an issue of uh, bandwidth right now right so even if people are willing to share data or uh, if there is any malice event uh, introduced right like uh, the system gets hacked uh, then the data gets generated is like a hacked data how do you kind of differentiate between it so those are the reasons that it, it cannot be shared in open source right now or the more generic view it's more closely work with devices as well as network you have more control of like the uh, devices that are being given in offices or hospitals so those are you know regularly checked for uh, securities and malware usage all that so it's mostly used on those places right now or cars where you know it's without that particular device nobody can update the code that's why the general public usage is less whereas the recommendation system and all that kind of are you know everybody can be used it does not matter much so those become very fast into the mainstream but this takes a bit of time uh, one question was my research is about computer vision and sports can I implement better learning if yes how can you briefly explain okay um, so one of the view that happens, what, what use case I had understood uh, when I worked on uh, similarly in sports analytics was that uh, let's say in football that you want to understand who has what or you kind of generate transcripts of uh, at how much time a particular player had the ball with him or her and whom they passed, was it a good pass or a bad pass, those kind of you know metrics that were done. So what it required was that the specific hardware to be placed around. So instead, maybe we can use uh, lower level hardware, but have models running multiple times on them that can kind of solve problems because now you don't need high tech uh, lenses or systems running on that kind of saves some cost on that. So that is one of the use cases that I can see we can use it uh, for a fast paced uh, system where, you know, instead of having high costly cameras systems, we can use uh, lower cameras, but have better models across. Uh, Ashish, I took the question, I'll add the books, but uh, papers are already there in the uh, PPT. Uh, you can have a look at it. Uh, drug discovery uh, not sure about the drug discovery however uh, one of the use case that i worked off was about the uh, in the uh, you know image classification basically uh, if you want to you get a lot of x-ray images or uh, pathological slides that they have and uh, having those shared across 
uh, if you have a good model, they don't need to spend that much time. Uh, they get benefit of somebody of a larger organization or larger hospital, which has produced more data and has more variation of the data. They, those models can be used for a hospital, which is on a smaller scale where you know, there is not much more data, but their model now become uh, more accurate with the help of others. So that was one of the use cases that I worked off uh, in federated learning. Uh, federated learning in business prediction? Uh, I don't think so, uh, because uh, when you want to predict disease, right? It's mostly uh, mostly uh, not at the end user, but more of at a hospital. So if we are thinking from that perspective, that uh, we look at all the OPD cases that come into a system and try to create a pattern out of it, then yes, we can use a federated learning, uh, because now local scenarios or local weather can also factor in. Uh, but if we are trying to get it from a person's data, I think it would be a bit difficult right now. Not We have not reached that part. How do you see federated learning? So federated learning basically uh, took half the learning from Web3, right? <laughs> because that, that's what we have. You have IoT devices and everything that we have at the end user and try to make sure that models also run there. So it kind of gets more localized to you uh, specifically as a user and you get more benefit out of it to your use cases. So I think always the Web3 and Petrit learning will go hand in hand. I saw one question in between. Huh. Uh, if one of the edge devices delayed to send the weights in uh, FL to centralize server, what will happen? So basically, uh, as I mentioned, right, I took an assumption that all 10 devices send everything at a time. This will never be at the case in the real time, right? There will be some who will be sending it later, some who will be sending it before. Again, uh, so what usually happens is uh, we take sample of it that uh, out of the population on so in so days, uh, certain devices will send in data and so on so days, the other section of the data will be shared. So what happens is that the system is created in such a way that whenever there is a downstream expected from it, right? So uh, let's say weekends in India are Sundays, but in UAE it's Friday, right? So we try to create system like that, that data comes from those regions or cities based on that. Uh, but it's all again in the customization when you create the final system, you have to take in uh, and create it like that. And let's say in a larger scheme of pictures, you have thousands of devices, if 10 or 15 don't come in, it does not make much difference. But let's say if your system is about 100 or 50 and then 10 does not come in, then it's uh, hit to your system or a model basically. So depends upon that as well, the scale of the system. Yeah, I think we are good. Uh, any questions, please feel free to add it into the chat or Q&A and I can answer it. How is model development? Yeah, so there is no difference, right? If you see here, uh, let's step back forward for a second. Uh, so how right now happens uh, in a centralized server is right. You upload your, uh, you create a model, you convert it into a pickle, or you zip it, and then kind of deploy it on a server as a, you know, uh, either as a web service or you have the model itself sitting there. Uh, but here, what, what has happened is uh, basically the model itself is on the client side, right? The same way which have we did it. Uh, so each pickle, uh, it, it's sitting on the system and then it's just uh, running it rather than a web service where a centralized uh, system gets called every time when they want to test something. So instead of that, the model itself is sitting there. It's like you're running your code on the local system, right? Uh, you have the complete model with you. There is no calling anybody. So that's the major difference between we have. So when you have either a web service that kind of answers, which is like a centralized approach, but here uh, all your data goes into your local machine, your local model. There is no centralized thing where you get called or do anything. So that's the major difference that you have. And again, how it gets pushed is uh, when the basic the device gets created or, um, or you can push it through the web service at the start uh, when how you update the system or OS or app updates that happen usually. So that's how you get pushed. So it still remains same. And just the calling happens differently. Instead of calling a central service, now you are you know calling model locally. 
uh, this will be similar to how you push your app updates, right? It's on the same track. Uh, so you can take an example of it, like uh, your current system, let's say it supports English, Hindi, Gujarati, your keyboard was supporting those three languages. Now a new language kind of comes up like French or anything. And now the support has been pushed in, right? It, it's on the same approach. Uh, that new feature will be pushed in. It will be a larger update than the usual, but the same approach happens whenever a new feature gets pushed to your Android device or an iOS device as of now. What's the minimum computing power? Uh, Sayan, again, it depends upon the system that you want or what is the complexity of the model that you have. Um, even right now, we have the Arduino boards and all that, right? Raspberry Pis, they are quite very powerful to be very frank. <laughs> so if you go 10, 15 years back, our computer system were not that powerful what our mobile device is right now. So I think we are good from that side. Uh, but let's say uh, you have uh, IoT devices like measuring temperature or just you know, doing one single task, uh, they might not be able to do everything a typical device can do or a whole model it can run. But, uh, if you are even able to get it like a Pentium one kind of stuff, it's good enough to run a model. Thank you. Bye-bye.